species, sex and race have overlaid. Um, and, and it was so interesting seeing, you know, thinking about that kind of conflation of genus and species and then the kind of operation of race. And I guess sex is there because of those questions of, you know, interreproducibility. But I guess looking forward, you know, because I, I take the kind of context of the talk is also to think about histories of racism in more complex ways. And they are so entangled with notions of species and notions of sex and hierarchies around sex <clears throat> as well. So I guess I just wondered, I know this is a little bit tangential yeah, no, to your no. talk, but whether that is a further thread yes. yeah. Boring. Yeah. yeah thank you very much well first of all that that word the way that people the way that the word race was used in Buffon, for example to mean something like a breed as you say it, people do still use it in that way, in zoology and in botany um and and Linnaeus used it uh, actually didn't use the word but Buffon used the word Linnaeus wrote in Latin and in Latin, but um, it, 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 had the, it has the same, zoology and botany has the same status really as the concept of a, of a variety, that is it has no taxonomical, uh, has no taxonomical status, it's like the difference between blonde people and dark haired people. But Kant's concept of race is totally different. And so that's why I think that someone like well, Robert Bernasconi says Kant invented the concept of race. I think he's justified in saying it because what he means is Kant was the first person to give a philosophical account of what a race is. And, and we counted at the time as a scientific concept of race. Um, so although the word was used by other people and it continues to be used in other contexts in a, in a sort of a quite general way, even now, there is something very different about what Kant is doing with that concept of race, which is saying, this is a way of determining natural biological differences between human beings. And in English, generally, now the word race in common parlance refers to humans doesn't it and not to not to other animals except if you're a pigeon fat you or something then you'll still be using it or as you say in botany it's still used um so so people criticize Bernasconi's point by saying other people used the word well they did use the word but they didn't determine the concept they didn't spend hours of their life over decades identifying what it was to be a member of a race, whereas Kant did. And actually, this, um, this talk is one half of, a, of an article which contrasts this history of the concept of race in Kant with the concept of sex in Kant. And as you say, they're so, especially in German, they're so imbricated because because when Kant was writing, the word, the German word Geschlecht could mean race, it could mean sex, it could just mean genus, actually. It can still be used in all of those ways. And one of the effect, one of the things that Kant did across many different words was to disambiguate these words. So at the end of Kant's life, as it were, you could say what he think, what he thought he had done was was to specify the way that the word race was to be used from now on, Persa, but also had the effect of limiting much more the use of the word Geschlecht to what we now mean as sex. So in his work, Geschlecht generally means sex. It doesn't mean race, even though strictly speaking, it could be translated as such. Um, and and, the, and the, what's very interesting is, um, and again, it's Robert Bernasconi who's done some really fascinating work on this. In the late 1700s and the early 1800s, there were dictionaries of Kantian thought published, or lexica. And in these dictionaries, there were huge entries on the concept of race. So whereas by you know, the early 20th century, philosophy had kind of forgotten, or press more likely, Kant's works on race, at the time, it was received as being one of his most important philosophical concepts. And, and Robert Bernasconi says, 
it, to the extent that it was his concept, it was identified as his concept in the late 18th, early um, 19th century. Um, so he didn't think you could take the concept of race for granted. He thought you had to do a lot of work to justify what it was. On the other hand, the concept of sex, you could just take that completely for granted and you could take for granted everything that went along. So in the anthropological works, you find no address to a scientific audience or in any of the works, no address to a scientific audience justifying the concept of sex, merely the presumption of sex difference and the presumption of all of the things that for him went along with that absolute presumption of a hierarchy. So when so there's so the concept of race has a really different history to the concept of sex. And I think that that's what you're pointing out, because now in anti-racist or anti-patriarchal discourses, we have to remember that there are these different histories. And I think that when we're thinking about intersectionality, for example, we have to remember that there are these different histories because there is no biological basis for the concept of race, but there is a biological basis for the concept of sex. I mean, I, this is a very long history, but, but it doesn't mean what people take it to mean. But the fact of the matter is, in, in sexual reproduction, there is a biological basis for the distinction between male and female, whatever male and female means. There's absolutely no biological basis for the concept of race. So they're, they're connected histories. They're really different histories, and that needs to be borne in mind. I think it's the point you're making when so still a lot of thinking to be done about this. And the concept of species as well. In, in Aristotle's in metaphysics, and in other places, mainly in the metaphysics, is really puzzled about what kind of different sex difference is. Actually, it doesn't have the word sex. It's really puzzled about what the difference, what kind of difference the difference between male and female is. And he goes through all the options. Is it a difference of genus? No. Is it a difference of species? No, it can't be. Is it merely a variation? No, it can't be. It's more important than that. And he, he ends up with having to invent a new logical category, more or less, to, just to say what it is. So you're absolutely right. The, the genus, species, sex, race, these are all you know, wrapped up into, into this incredibly complex history, but each with its different path intersecting parts of different it's so parts. interesting and then with different afterlives so yes like laying together yes yeah mm -hmm. and and different and different in different languages as well so whereas in the 1960s it was quite easy to introduce the sex gender distinction for example into into english it wasn't easy to introduce that into german and so other and so feminists well, you know, Feminists speaking other European languages often use the English terms because we were able to make a distinction that was not able to be made so easily with existing words in other languages. And gen gender, of course, is just another translation of genus. Yeah. We have a, a question from someone online. So Kevin writes. Hi, thanks for the talk. It was very interesting. I was wondering how Kant's idea of race fits with his idea of judgment in the sense where he talks of beauty as a particular, um, as a particular thing and not universal. His example was a rose being beautiful and that beauty picks out the particular rose, not all roses. So how does that fit with the idea of race? Do we judge the race as a whole or particular? Um, I think I think the answer is neither, because because we we have to introduce into the thinking of race, according to Kant, historical genealogical considerations. That's what makes thinking about living things completely different from uh, thinking about even the beauty of natural things. So I think you know, whether it's a universal or particular is a, is a logical question. But in order, to be, in order to speak about race as something natural, uh, we have to make a move that can't possibly be made in the first critique at all. 
um, that that we see being made in the third critique in the critique of teleological judgment rather than the critique of aesthetic judgment to introduce history and thus to introduce genealogy into our as well thinking so um so i mean it's, it's connected i suppose because the whole of the third critique is as it were unified by the principle of purposiveness um, I think we need to we need to separate out the discussion of beauty from the discussion of race. But of course, when it comes to making really you know, prejudiced claims, about which is the most beautiful race, you can probably guess how that falls out for, uh, for Kant. But otherwise, we need to separate the discussions out. I think. Okay, so we have other questions, either from anyone in the room or perhaps uh, online. Um, thanks ever so much for the talk, Esther. It's really interesting. Um, I think I've got two questions. They come from a common um, focus on, on, on Kant's influence and uh, legacy. And so I was reflecting and I really liked your points about seeing the concept of race um, in the context of political philosophy. And I was thinking through how some of the issues you mentioned earlier and stuff to do with things that also um, appear vexing in terms of Kant's attempt to claim transcendental idealism and again, implicit anthropocentrism, the discussion of regulative ideas. So I think it's really interesting to put race in that context. What strikes me is how different that is from how race is often discussed in the context of Kant. So I'm thinking here of debates within Kant's moral philosophy, mm -hmm. and so we see how it's and and so one question would be: Do you do you think that they are focus more in Kant's moral philosophy? Or anthropology or politics is, is a fudge, is it is a way of, of deflecting from how central this, this issue is within or ought to be for Kant scholars. And um, I like the way I phrased that, so by all means feel free to address uh, that. And so that's the kind of, that's one question. I suppose you could say, does it, does it sit at the center? Let's call it logic, whether general or transcendental. Does it sit with the moral philosophy? Um, and the other issue was a more kind of empirical one, which was, um, you know, granting Berlusconi's point regarding Kant's influence on the concept of race. I wonder if you could just are there any examples of how this concept takes off in, in the German Academy? Because we can. Um, to go back to the first question about so there is a lot of discussion of of Kant's and race and the moral philosophy and political philosophy um, well, I mean one thing I would say is I think that the, the, the absolute wrong question for us to be asking now is was Kant a racist because I think that we know that he was, and what's, what's you know, what we really need to know is, um, is what is the what, what is the influence of the works on race? What is the relation between the work on race and the other work? Um, it's not about this man who lived in Königsberg. In, 18th century it's about a set of texts that we inherit and has the most unbelievable you know, influence and important legacy in, in European philosophy um, but I don't think that we need to say is it most important to see to think about the relation to the critical philosophy or the relation to the moral or political philosophy because they're all I mean there's more recent work by Jennifer Mensch for example um, which says they're all unified by the question of, of 
which Kant actually says in the third critique, I think it is, what is man? They're actually all unified by the fact that the human being is the topic of all of Kant's work in one way or another. But, but more particularly, um, the, you know, the political works like um, the perpetual peace essay, the um, metaphysics of morals and so on, they're all, they're all perfectly consistent with this account of race and the progress of the human race and the, you know, the fact that different parts of the world have a different role to play at different times in the progress of the human race. So it's all absolutely consistent with itself. Um, so there's another way, there's another way of addressing the problem, which is to say, okay, so there's this very regrettable stuff on race, but what about that universalism, guys? Isn't that great? You know, and isn't it great that he says that there's absolute equality? Well, look in the for example, he doesn't say that. He says that women are naturally inferior and cannot achieve active citizenship. Um, Charles Mills has the most sophisticated reason, reading of that, which says you know, he, that the, we can use these works uh, as demonstrating to us the extent to which all modern conceptions of society are racialized in one way. So I don't, I don't hold, I don't, I don't accept the idea that there's a contradiction between Kant's universalism and his, his racism, and his sexism, because they're, they're actually folded in quite consistently into his project. So in, in the Metaphysics of Morals, he talks about how it can be the case that the most perfect equality is compatible with the greatest inequality. I mean, we don't have to dig that out of Kant. It's, it's explicit in his arguments. So I think that we have to, we have to, well, you know, all of the works must be seen in relation to each other. We don't need to separate them out. On the question of his influence, um, I mean, actually, he was, he was criticised quite heavily by a lot of, uh, a lot of his, his German you know, contemporaries or near contemporaries. Um, I think. I think for me, the more important point is that what I wanted to, to get across was the fact that Kant was a monogenesist and he said that, that there are not different species of human beings will be used by some people to say, well, at least he said that. At least he didn't think human, white people and black people were different species. But he had replaced the species concept with the race concept. So there's a sense in which he might as well have said that they were different species. Yes, they're the same genus, but there is a classificatory difference below genus. And I think that that is, that in a, that was what we have, as it were, unconsciously inherited in European racism. The idea that, um, that there is some classificatory difference between what we call different races that is somehow different to the distinction between blonde people and neck people. Yeah. Uh, uh, tall people and short people. I think that the, the European racism is based on the idea that the races are classificatory categories. And that's what, that's what we've inherited from Kant, who was the first um, to, to really articulate that explicitly and as I said we it's not that it's not that we that any European racist knows that that's you know that has any relation to Emmanuel Kant but somehow that's what has become inherited so racism has to treat the difference between the human races as, a, as different to the difference between mere breeds of dog for example we don't need there's no sort of hierarchy of breeds of dog, or at least you know, maybe maybe people have their own hierarchies, but there's no, there's no sort of general hierarchy of the different breeds of dogs. Whereas racism is simply about there being a hierarchy that is based on a classificatory difference that is thought to be more uh, thought to be 
precisely classificatory difference, not a mere variety. I wondered if you had, did you, were you thinking of any of his German? No, no, uh, it's just a really interesting, um, interested in that. I mean, I was thinking about Leiden's philosophy and how it um, stands in relation to that. That was the that whole complex relationship with Bergson's um, critique of Kant. Um, but it was rather up in, in that area, it was a question of you know, the, um, so the deal um, was on the, the module. We did a, a level three module and we agreed on this question, you know, the really irrelevant question is, what's this man from Königsberg? Yes. Um, yeah. 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 yeah, we need to move Anything else? I've got a further one, but only after this. Uh, we'll go and do you know where we're uh, waiting for some other question? Well, I guess it's just uh, kind of, <laughs> bringing things back to thinking about sex as well because it just kept on thinking while you're talking but um but you know because of Kant taking on you know, this notion of you know reproducibility um whether it's for genus or for species as a category um, I guess that is tied up with very very particular ways of thinking about sex as well um and and thinking about reproduction, so and, and, and reproductive labor, and there's a whole series of kind of hierarchies in that. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'm thinking that both in relation to questions of reproduction and in relation to species, or perhaps the way that that as a concept for biologists has also, is also starting to be challenged. You know, there are all kinds of more distributed ways of thinking about reproduction, and there are all kinds of ways in biology now of thinking species or thinking that maybe species isn't the most helpful unit for us to, you know, to operate with. So I guess I'm just really interested in how you know, everything that you're saying about the, the emergence of races at classificatory and, and having that common stem and that their common stem is organized around a certain idea of reproduction. Um, but it, it's just so fascinating because you're right that these there are these very different histories and there's probably also the sense in which I guess someone like Michelle Ledeuf would say that, that often women are referred to in philosophy in, in, a, in a matter of an aside you know and so the rigor to make an argument there's just it's just okay to have some casual Yes, yes, you know, yes. and so that there's there's all of that at play as well. But I, I just think it is so fascinating thinking about how all those terms also start to overlay and operate together. Yes, yeah, and and you could say at the end of the 18th century, given the history, you know, of European colonialism and the ongoing you know, project of European colonialism, and the uh, you know, the knowledge of the slave trade and the knowledge of that, it was, it was as if you had to think about this because this was what was going to justify colonialism and imperialism and slavery. Whereas you didn't have to think about sex because no, because this, this is the period predating uh, the, the point at which uh, there was any there was any great agitation amongst women, what we would now call feminist agitation amongst women. Obviously, there were women who wrote books against patriarchy before then, but in, in general, one could just presume the superiority of men over women without having to justify it. But it looks very much like a point in history had been reached at which the slave trade in particular was so egregious you couldn't just take it for granted you, you had to produce more or less bad faith justifications for it and the concept of race was one of those so it's also the different geopolitical histories and social histories that account for the different treatment of the concepts and, and do you think that it's also 
could also say that there are certain easy ways that certain presumptions about sex and hierarchies get smuggled into the thinking about race and about genus in an uncritical way, while on the other hand, obviously, as you're saying, that that thinking can't really slows down and spends an enormous amount of time to, to produce this concept because there is a pressure to address. Yes, yes. I don't quite, I, I mean, I'm sure that's the case. I don't quite know what to say about it, no. you know, just at the moment, but also, you know, it's, in 1735, in his Systema Naturae, that was the first time that human beings had been placed in a system of classification because, and, and you know, that would have been thought blasphemous to some because it, it's, it just placed them within the animal kingdom you know, rather than saying, no, there's something very special and particular about humans. Um, so it doesn't, it seems to me that it's not, it's not a coincidence that this moment in which humans are placed for the first time within systems of classification and uh, and that of course leads to the to the classification of human beings themselves which you already see in a, in a certain way in the um, yeah, that it's the, the the insertion of the human being into zoological classification is is coincident with the class the beginning of the classification of human races um, or the theorization let's say of the classification of human races i suppose what's very different about sex is that is, is, is as i said earlier that this is really this is really the beginning of the um using the concept of race to refer to humans very specifically and not other animals whereas obviously the concept of man, concepts of man and female are always applied to other animals and indeed this is the historical period in which they're beginning to be applied to plants in a different way as well in not in not in a merely metaphorical way but in a, in a way that is recognizing something like sexual reproduction amongst plants as well so the, the concepts of female and male are generic in a very very real sense and can't be just reserved for human beings whereas the concept of race is being reserved for human beings effectively and hence why even though in principle it could be applied to other other species it is it's not, it's not happening, it's not going to happen. And, and what we inherit is the idea that race is something, that is a, that's a human thing. Now, now I think that we, we use that word, we deserve the use of that word for humans in everyday discourse as well. A kind of a question. Yeah. Um, so is Kant's theory of generic difference rendered inoperative in Estonian theories of evolution? Because it seems like at least at one point he seems to be wanting to point to differences in form as being important to how we distinguish between um, genuses. But with, uh, with evolutionary theory, because Darwin, you have extreme transformation. Mm. So you have, I mean, I was, I was shot uh, when I uh, uh, whales evolved from something a bit like wolves. You know? yes, so yes. we think, well, how could you, if, yes. if we're tracing um, this kind of germ and it's possible different developments, it doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense in terms of our understanding of radical transformations. Yeah. But actually, it doesn't make sense even on its own term because, because Kant puts himself in the position of saying there are four races and they're fixed and there will only ever be four races. It's preposterous, you know. Mm. And the idea that skin colour is the only thing that's unfailingly inherited from, from your parents. So, so, you know, your parents might both have blue eyes, for example, but you might more brown eyes so eye color is not unfailingly inherited but skin color is but obviously the way that skin color is inherited is such as to, to prove that there is no fixity i mean it's such a contradiction in in his work it's such a 
it's such a moment of, of kind of blindness, um, which indicates that there's an ideological need to fix the four races, no, no actual argument for it. Um, and I mean, I was going to actually say in relation to Dina's question there, even Darwin thought that species were only wild varieties. I mean, he kept says that over and over and over and over again in the origin of the species. And now I think where species are defined phy phylogenetically or general defined phylogenetically, all you're saying is you're, you're as it were, just identifying a historical moment in, in evolution which has not finished and saying just at the moment this is what we'll call the genus you know and we'll identify and we'll identify it on the basis of dna which of course he had no access to I mean, you can see the way that pre-darwinian actual history is coming to terms with the whole genealogical inheritance you know problematic but obviously not able to quite get there yet Okay, so we have um, two more comments. We have a comment um, from Katja who says, just a small remark, I don't know if it's useful at all. In today's German and Italian language, race, um, rasa, rasa, is used for humans, but also for dogs, cats, horses, etc. So the same concept slash word for animal breeds and human races. Not the same concept, obviously, but the same word. Okay, thank you. Hi, Katya. So you know, um, yes, I did know that actually. Um, so, it's waving back. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I did know that. So I should have, I should have specified. Yeah, that in English, this is the way that the word. This is the primary meaning of the word in English now. Um, but. Uh, well, I suppose part of my point is that it seems to me that one of the effects of Kant's essays on race is that he wanted to reserve the word rasa for human beings. Um, he didn't get to dictate how that how that played out in the end. But thank you very much for the point. And, it, and it, it, as we said earlier, all of these conceptual histories have to be thought in different languages um, because you know, we just because we don't, it's not just that the words don't sort of map onto each other, but it is the, it's the effect of the differences in the different languages that often leads to the conceptual innovations. Okay, and we have another question from Kevin. Without being an Enlightenment figure, seeing Europe as civilized, unlike other places, does his idea of a lesser race attached to being civilized, so let's say a hillbilly in the upper, uneducated and tied to necessity, um, would they not be identical? So would they not be identical other than skin color to people he saw as lesser? Did you follow that? Yes, yes, yes. Um... Um, well, I don't, I don't know quite how to answer that. I suppose um, you know, in a way, it's the, it's the problem that every racist faces, isn't it? Um, it's the problem that every patriarchal racist faces because they want simultaneously to claim that men are superior to women, whilst having to accept that some women must be superior to some men. And patriarchy means that all men must be superior to all women. But their sexism, uh, their racism means that some women must be superior to some men. It is in fact the problem that Plato faces in the Republic, which leads him to, to uh, to understand that he has to allow guard women into the guardian class. Um, so it's not it's not something it's not something that Kant addresses explicitly, but in the in the metaphysics of morals, for example, he talks about class differences. 
and how that translates into civil inequalities, necessary civil inequalities, how it's not possible for a labourer to be an active citizen, as it's not possible for a woman to be an active citizen. Um, but I think that the theory of race is, is more important geopolitically. That's more about about the spreading of the human beings over, of human beings over the whole earth um, and the, the contemporary history, the contemporary moment of uh, European expansionism. And, and for the purposes of dealing with that particular phenomenon, we use the theory of race. For the purposes of dealing with more domestic problems, as it were, he makes the distinction between working class men and men of his own class. I, I can't think of how these, these two things cohere. Okay, any, um, any further questions or should we um, wrap it up? Just very briefly, um, Ashley's point made me think of what is in terms of the problem of the you know, it's the obsession with possibility <laughs> becomes really problematic. Um, I'm thinking of Bergson's critique of possibility and Kant's fascination with it. And your comment about the sub notion of the four races. So yeah. it just struck me as interesting. Yeah. Well, what do you mean? What why is it, how is it connected to possibility? Just in this in the sense that um let's say there are four possible um ways of thinking about race rather than in terms of um, evolution and he's really really he thinks that there's an actuality or this is not a possibility, and not a possibility of any more races either, which is such a, so extraordinary, so hard to understand how he could, he could hold that in his mind as, not, as a allegedly rational thought, yet he did. Okay, well, let's all thank Stella for a very interesting talk. And just to quickly announce, our next seminar will be next week. Uh, so look out for some information about that. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Ashley. Yeah, thank you.